So good morning, everyone. My name is Jermaine Richter, and this awesome young man next to me is my son, John, and we are here to welcome you to the Sunday morning worship service of the Monco region of the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. So welcome, everybody. Um, so we are one of four regions in the sort of greater Philadelphia area, but there's actually a fifth location that, yes, a fifth location that I love to worship and also commune with God, and that is at Camp Hope for Kids yeah. in Shrinksville, Pennsylvania. So yesterday, John and I and James uh, had the opportunity with many of you to serve at our annual camp cleanup. And that's always an adventure. <laughs> we got to hang out with Sean and um, Riley and Nolan, had a little corner of the lodge that we were cleaning. Um, but yeah, we love going to camp. You know, it's a beautiful area, it's a beautiful uh, location. Um, John started going there when he was eight years old and this is actually his last year um, going to our camp. Um, but then he's going on a teen camp so uh, next year, so it'll be great. Um, but I recall, uh, I think, you know, several years ago, when both boys went to camp together at the same time, and Kirk and I were like, woohoo! <laughs> we were celebrating. We were like, yeah, what are we going to do with the whole week? Just the two of us, you know? Kirk took off work, and we had kind of like a staycation, and it was great. It was awesome. And then... Um, I don't know, the following year, um, I decided to volunteer. And that's when, uh, at our camp, so parents get the opportunity if they want to serve at our camp. There are many, many opportunities there to serve. Um, and that's when I started to fall in love with camp and saw how really, truly, what a beautiful, beautiful location itself it is. Um, but uh, it was just quiet, peaceful. So I would get up early in the morning and go on long walks Lots of little nooks and crannies and trails that you can go on. There's a, like a lake for our friends that are visiting who aren't familiar, trying to like paint a picture for you. There's a lake, there's a bridge that you can walk across and like some waterfalls flowing down. It's amazing. And um, if you want a quiet place to pray, there's lots of opportunities to pray. And then sometimes I would sing uh, very quietly <laughs> to myself. Um, but yeah, the, the, the property is beautiful. There's lots of opportunities for kids to kind of get away from their devices, you know, because phones aren't allowed at our camp. You know, you know screen time. They uh, get to get outside, get some fresh air. Um, and there's an amazing like, pool, the rock wall they rebuilt, it's beautiful. Um, and uh, there's a, like a Gaga court. Anybody here ever do a Gaga? Some of the veterans. I think uh, it's a rite of passage when you do um, uh, go to camp and you do Gaga to get Gaga knuckles. And so the area that I would volunteer in is the nurses station. I have no background at all in nursing, but I am a mom and I know how to clean a, um, a boo-boo, put a band-aid on, give them a hug, pat them on the back, and <laughs> send them on their way. So that's what I do the six days that I um, get a chance to serve. Um, but the, the most amazing thing about camp is that they, they teach our kids, right? They start to train them. Um, so if you guys want to start turning to Proverbs uh, verse 20, chapter 22, verse 6, John is going to read that scripture in a minute here. But yeah, the wonderful thing about camp um, truly is that the kids get to learn about God. Um, they get an opportunity to hear his word daily, memory scriptures daily and really uh, take his word in, put it in their heart, and you know, um, as the scripture John shares, is gonna share, hopefully they'll keep those words with them and they um, won't depart from it. So John's gonna share. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. So, uh, as we continue on in our service, uh, Jim Espenche will be bringing us the communion. Um, our amazing Kim Evans will be doing the contribution and the announcement, and our fearless leader, fearless leader, Walter Evans, will be doing it, preaching our sermon. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Jim Espenshade. It's uh, my privilege to uh, be with uh, you this morning. 
as uh, I leave your thoughts here in communion, I just want to say thank you to, uh, to you and, and to the leadership here, Walter, just uh, entrusting me here to lead us in our thoughts this morning. Um, as we do that, I just want to give you my theme, and you can turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, is love. You know, um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we're so glad that you're here. Um, uh, I'm married, I right? just had the 26-year um, anniversary, May 9th, so praise God. My wife has put up with me for 26 years. So, uh, but um, I did want to share a little bit of background in the sense of visiting this in particular. Um, my wife and I um, have gone through a very difficult time, and I just did communion about, I guess, two months ago, and just shared a lot about how it's been really challenging. Um, my wife has a work-related concussion and uh, brain injury. She was uh, consulting a teacher back in November um, last year, it's been almost six months now, where she was uh, consulting a teacher on how to deal with a difficult child, and that's what she does as, as a profession. When she went to go sit down, she missed the stool and smacked the back of her head, and ever since then, our life has been a little bit upside down. And it's been challenging, you know, she's um, still not able to drive, um, she's still not at work, but we're hopeful. And uh, I'll give a little bit of an update in a second, but I say that because um, love, I've, I've been thinking in preparing this communion, you know, just how amazing God is in his love. See, we, we can all relate to pain. You know, I just want to share in Isaiah 54, verse 4, and part of verse 5, and this is uh, um, in the GNT version, but it says, But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God, but because of our sins, he was wounded. Do you guys remember the, the Super Bowl, at least for me, my world revolves sometimes around sports, but Super Bowl, remember how like there's this commercial that says, Jesus gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus gets pain. Isaiah 54 makes it very clear, Jesus gets it. He endured pain. And sometimes I need to, to understand that as we push across this morning, Jesus gets you. You know, and all of us go through different types of pain, and, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes, um, you know, I'm the kind of person where it's like, but why? You know, it's funny, I've made a career being a doctor, and I take care of a lot of pain. But I could do it without it. I like to be out of a job, actually. It'd be kind of cool having no more pain, wouldn't it? I mean, I, let's, let's be honest, I mean, I know confidently if all of you had a choice between A, living a life of pain, and B, living a life without pain, I'm sure all of you would choose point, uh, cho you know, choice two, right? Yeah. If you don't, come and talk to me afterwards. I'm concerned about you. <laughs> yeah, but we would choose no pain. Which even, even leads me to another question, but why? Because sometimes we can start questioning it, like, why? We're human beings, we question these things, why? Why the pain? And I, you know, when I think about pain itself, I think the re one of the reasons why is because it could become all-consuming. Yeah. We can get self, so self-focused with pain. It can be overwhelming, overbearing, to the point where we can't see anything else but our pain. Yeah. And that's a scary place to be, because then we start doubting. We can start questioning even God and his existence. We can start doing all sorts of things because the pain can get that bad. And I think Jesus can relate to that. I'm not going to get into it for the sake of time, but Garden of Gethsemane, to me, when Jesus is overwhelmed to the point of death, he gets it. He's at a point where he's like, he can see nothing but what's about to occur, the pain, both physically and emotionally. He gets it. But I also think that it's during those times that it's not the final destination. We have to keep in mind that even though, no matter what kind of pain that we're in, it's not where God wants us to be. And I think it's important to ask that question, why? Because I think as Christians, it arms us to overcome the pain. I think we need to be armed, church. I think we need to understand, at least to ask the question, and understand the why, and I think the Bible provides an answer, why? You know, in Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The main answer in the scripture is love. And I don't have all the answers. I'm not acting like I do. And I think there's even other answers to this question of why. 
But I think the main answer to me, according to Scripture, is love. You know, I can't um, thank you, the church, enough. You know, after I shared communion last time about the difficulties of just what Prudence and I have been through, how many times, many of you, and even this morning, I think it's the Holy Spirit working, because I've walked in there, I think about at least, uh, well, I'll just say multiple, multiple people have asked me, so how's your wife? And I can't thank you enough for the amount of times you guys have come up to me and said, hey, even if it's just for two seconds, I'll pray for Prudence. Prudence wrote a letter. She's here with us. <laughs> it says, Dear Monco Region, thank you for the care and support you have given to my family and me during this challenging time. I appreciate your prayers, texts, cards, and gifts. They make me smile each time I see or think about them. I truly feel blessed to be part of our wonderful church family, Love Prudence. You know, pain is not the final destination. I am amazed about the outpouring of love that we have received. And maybe you're feeling pain this morning, and you know, for different reasons. You know, sometimes it's not physical pain like we've had to do, or and it's also been emotional. But there's emotional pain. I know there's pain from loss. I know there's pain from difficulties and situations. I know there's physical pain. But I want you to have hope that it's not the final destination. Cross points us in a very different direction. You know, as I was preparing this this morning, I was even thinking about the love that God pours on Jesus. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't sometimes think about it that way. But I was even thinking about in Romans 6, um, verse 10 to 11, even beyond Romans 5, it talks about how the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. I thought, man, that's just now pouring a love to his own son. Jesus' body never saw decay. God just raised him from the dead. In a lot of ways, Jesus would go on to minister to people after he was raised for the next four days, just being a, a message of love. God raised me. I trusted in him. I went through the pain. I died on the cross. Yet Jesus loved me. And, I mean, God loved me. And God raised me three days later, and here I am. What a powerful message of love. And you know, it's even, if you can't even understand that, I'll just say this in Romans 6. It even goes beyond and says, you know, the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. That's right. That's right. What kind of love is that? That maybe on the outside we might be wasting away, but on the inside we have something that lives and has hope and it is the final destination, which is God, which is love. Amen. And thank God for that. So, brothers and sisters, as we, as we take communion this morning, remember the death, burial, and resurrection, let's remember love. It's so much better than pain. And yes, God gets it. If you're despondent this morning, you're feeling anguish, God gets it. But that's not what he wants you to rest. And brothers and sisters, I know this. It's funny, as a parent, I was thinking about all the different times I've been through some really difficult situations. Sometimes I don't think I even see God's love until later. Sometimes it's in ways that you can't even, you're not even looking for it in that way. But I'm telling you right now, seek the Lord, and he's there. He is love. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this morning, God, that we could be here today in your presence. Please bless us, God, as we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, and your love demonstrated in that. That, God, even though we were sinners and we, we've, we've all gone astray, God, you, um, you were able to really cancel that, that debt that we owe to you through the blood of Jesus Christ, nailed to the cross. And the love doesn't stop there, God, because Jesus endured that pain in the cross, and yet he was raised, and he's able to minister us to us today. And we're so grateful for that, God. Thank you for all these blessings, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, song, ministry. Once again, great to be with all of you. Welcome to our guest. Good to see Dan and April with us. They're visiting. We have to call them visitors now. They've moved, but they're back. Take care of some things. So great to see you guys. And uh, just great to be together. Uh, I was away last weekend, and uh, thanks to Evan for preaching. Evan's here somewhere. And uh, he took, took, the, took the lead, so I appreciate that. Went to see my mother in Atlanta, my 91-year-old mother. And she is doing very well. Sharp as a tack. Yeah, physically, yeah, you know. 91 is 91. 
But boy, she could win Jeopardy every night. She is amazing in terms of her ability to recall. So uh, that was a great trip and uh, great to be down there. My sister's down there as well as well. Kim has a sister in Atlanta. And as it turns out, uh, her son and his family will be moving to Atlanta in July, so there may be more trips coming up. You never know, grandkids and all that. And by the way, it's great to have Aubrey with us, our youngest of five grandchildren. Now all rumor, rumors are put to rest. There was concern, as I shared a few weeks ago, that maybe uh, Gigi and Grandpa don't go to church because they didn't see us at the other region service. And so now they can spread the word. Yes, we in fact do have church service and we are faithful in terms of our commitment. So, great. Well, we're going to continue with the series that we've been talking about for the month of May, Eyes That See. And uh, today we're going to talk about a topic called the kingdom. In fact, see the vision of the kingdom. And the kingdom is kind of an interesting phrase. I don't know about you, but really before I came in contact with uh, our family of churches or even reading the Bible, the kingdom was kind of an antiquated term that you didn't hear very much unless it was used in a negative way. Uh, and, and so not, not something that's kind of everyday vernacular. And yet in the Bible, we read about the kingdom in the New Testament in lots of different contexts, right? We, we read about the kingdom of heaven, and so that is where we're all looking to go, right? The book of Matthew uh, uses the phrase kingdom of heaven uh, 31 times, okay? So the writer, Matthew, is making it clear there's this place called the kingdom of heaven, and that's where we're going to go. A lot of those verses are found in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is talking about uh, looking ahead. So that's one, one version, one iteration of the idea of the kingdom. But... Jesus also talks about an earthly kingdom. And we, in fact, uh, read in Matthew chapter 16, after Peter makes his proclamation, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, uh, Jesus says, I'm going to give you what? Some keys, not car keys, not house keys, but in fact, keys to the kingdom of God. And it's talking more about that the kingdom is here on earth. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, that famous day that we call Pentecost, or we don't just call it that, it's called Pentecost. And uh, that Peter has the opportunity to preach the first gospel message. And the doors are open. And Peter, in fact, uh, preaches the, the message to the point where uh, thousands of men and women get baptized. And, in fact, that's the establishment of the kingdom on earth, as we call the church. Okay, so that's another version or another uh, iteration of kingdom that we read about in the New Testament. And then there's a curious reference in the New Testament as well about the kingdom being within you. In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, uh, Jesus says it's not here or there, but in fact, the kingdom is within you. Uh, that's the older NIV translation. Some of you are looking at it right now and saying mine doesn't say that because the translators also came back and said the kingdom of heaven is around you, okay? And really the, uh, the writers are making the point through the spirit that the kingdom is not a physical thing. It is here on earth, but it's something that we are a part of. It's not about a building. Okay, a lot of us grew up thinking, I'm going to church. That was a building, stained glass and pews and all that kind of stuff. And that's not actually what the kingdom is. It's not this auditorium. It's not Germantown Academy. It's not the TPAC building at Temple. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is us. The kingdom is the people. And the kingdom is something kind of... Uh, beyond the physical, okay? That's your Bible lesson for today. Everybody got it? <laughs> That's the kingdom. What we're going to talk about today, though, in regards to our eyes being open and eyes that see is the second one, the earthly kingdom that we call the church because Jesus did talk about uh, the vision of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 16 and Acts chapter 2. And, you know, really talking about something that was the people, okay? Uh, the church, once again, it's not a building, but even the word church in Greek, ekklesia, is those that are called out. That those in the early church were supposed to be different from the world. They're supposed to be separate from the world. And that's our focus for today, is let's talk about that kingdom. Let's talk about the kingdom being the church. Now, when we talk about something physical that involves people. When we talk about organizations, 
we get all excited, right? Because we can relate to that. Probably most everybody in this room is a part of some organization, either at work or in your community or a book club or a sports team or maybe you're cheer cheering the Phillies on or whatever, but you consider yourself to be a part of that. And that's real physical people that are united around something and they're kind of all pulling in the same direction. You got me? And, and so that's kind of the focus that we're going to talk about as far as the kingdom and eyes that see our vision for the kingdom today, talking about the church. You know, that concept can get us to go to unspiritual places sometimes. In that we can start talking so much about the organization that we miss the bigger points. Yeah. You know, we see that once again with even corporations. Um, there can be bad things that happen within corporations. Uh, that's nobody's condoning that uh, we see and, and obviously we need to brace ourselves and get ready for the ramping up of what's about to happen in our country regarding politics right that's a physical group of people organization but sometimes the rhetoric the things that get said the, the actions or reactions are not righteous are not good aren't spiritual but that happens when you pull people together and put them all in one place, pulling in the same direction. We see things like competition coming out. Uh, we see that uh, people sometimes have ulterior motives or things aren't great. And so as we talk about even the church that Jesus talks about in the Bible and that being the kingdom on earth, we need to realize that that kingdom, including us, is comprised of humans that are not perfect and that there are traps set along the way, right? Yeah. And we've got to learn to navigate that because the third version of the kingdom is the spiritual thing that we really can't see. That is what God is wanting us to aim for. Not just a building, not just a group of people, not just physical things, but the kingdom of God being within us and around us. Let's go to the book of Luke in chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and, and today, for just a few minutes, we're just going to put ourselves in the place of those disciples that have been with Jesus and his ministry roughly for three years or so at this point. And it's kind of getting towards the end. There's been a lot of things that have been going on. There's been miracles. There's been crowds gathering. Uh, a lot of things have happened. And in fact, when we go to Luke 22... We see that Judas has already left to betray Jesus, so that's, that's a plot that's already in place. Okay, that's happening. And we see uh, that we're going to pick up reading just after that Jesus has celebrated what we call the Last Supper. He didn't call it that, we do, but that's what it was. That was his last special time, the last meal together uh, with his disciples before he'd go to the cross. So Luke 22, starting in verse 29. This is what Jesus says to that gathering of disciples. I and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You got to believe that those disciples got fired up. They're like, finally, this is it. We're having the Last Supper. That guy Judas is out of here. Let's talk about really what's going to happen right now. And Jesus says, I'm conferring something on you to confer, to grant, to bestow, or to gain a title or obtain a right. So Jesus is saying, okay, here's the moment. I'm now passing what was given to me by my father, the kingdom. I'm passing it on to you. And what did he say? You're going to get to do some things. You're going to eat and drink at my table. You're going to sit on thrones. And you're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm sure they're like, yes, that's good stuff. That's what we've been hoping for. Because remember, once again, in the context, they were oppressed people. Okay, these Jews were held down by the Roman Empire. They were treated badly, like dogs. They were made to carry a Roman soldier's uh, heavy pack an extra five miles or whatever, and that's what they were called to do by law. I mean, they, they were so sick of being oppressed and being under the boot of the emperor 
that when Jesus says, hey, I'm giving you a kingdom, you're going to sit at my table, you're going to sit on thrones, and you're going to judge the 12 tribes. How many of us in any worldly organization, if we had that meeting with the, the boss that says, listen, I'm going to set you up corner office. You're going to go to all the fancy dinners. So I'm going I'm to get you tied in, and you get to have an opinion about everybody else. You can judge. You can decide what the rest of those underlings now under you get to do. In a worldly context, we're like, finally, I've made it. I've been climbing this ladder and struggling to get here, but finally, I'm getting my dues. I'm getting what's supposed to come to me, what I've prayed about, looked for, worked for, maybe not prayed about, but, you know, that's kind of the way we are in the world. And Jesus is hinting at that with these disciples. And I'm sure that they were getting excited. But I've kind of jumped ahead here on purpose. Because there's a greater context. And we need to read the chapter in context to really understand what Jesus is talking about here. Because he's not talking about giving them all this power to wield and authority to throw around and being the big boss. So we're going to get them asking three questions. We're going to get them to, to, to ask what is most on their hearts and their minds as they're beginning to look at this uh, picture that Jesus is painting. So if we go to Luke 22 and verse 24, one of their first questions, of course, is who is the greatest? Question number one, who's the greatest? A dispute arose among them as to which one of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, but those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves, is not the one at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. Oh, downer. Talk on it. What are you talking about? I've been serving. I've been that guy. Yet Jesus is saying, no, if you're going to be inheriting this kingdom, if you're going to be the, the benefactor, the recipient of the kingdom, the greatest among you must be those who serve. Our world is filled with rankings, lists, accomplishments, people that are climbing a, a social ladder, if you will. You know, I don't know about you, but I got a tablet and the news feed always wants to put out a ranking, right? Top 10 this, top 50 that, best places to go, this actor versus that actor, this athlete versus that athlete, right? And we're inundated with lists and where people rank, where they fit, who's the greatest, that's the thing. Who gets to be at the top? And we tend to feed on this a little bit. You know, let's just take a little poll here for a minute. Who's the greatest? Let's go pop star. You only get two choices. Pick one or the other. Taylor Swift or Beyonce? Beyonce. <laughs> All right, hand gal. How many of you say Taylor Swift is the greatest? Raise your hand. All right? I know. You don't, you don't get to do that same choice. I know. You only get one or the other. Beyonce, raise your hand. Look at that. It's interesting. We've got a bit of a divide. <laughs> we got this group versus that group. Okay. That's the pop star. Who's the greatest, Taylor Swift or Beyonce? Let's do basketball. You only get two choices. Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Michael Jordan, greatest of all time, or LeBron James? Michael Jordan first. Hand up. Oh. Hands down. LeBron James. There we go. We've got LeBron James over here. Okay. Greatest, okay. Listen, we all do a, a finish. Tom Brady, is he the greatest of all time in terms of quarterback? Greatest quarterback of all time. A lot of people would say he's the GOAT, he's the man, he's the one. 
We're not going to get into other areas, presidential candidates or other things. We're not going to get into problems here. But you know, what we do learn is, is this is very much a part of our culture, of our world, and it also draws us in, doesn't it? Because obviously there's nobody in this room that's the greatest quarterback of all time, unless I, I, I'm looking at the group. I'm pretty sure that's not <laughs> So we don't we don't rank, but but we do wonder <laughs> we do wonder how we rank at work or what people think about us, and this sort of stuff kind of gets in our heads a little bit. Now the other thing is all this gets personality driven, doesn't it? To where all of a sudden it's just name recognition. It's just the the stuff on the outside, the big stuff that they've done that draws everybody in, and then maybe long after they're considered the greatest of all time, you find out later, wow, there's some bad stuff. But in that moment, they were at the top, they were number one, it was personality driven, right? And we also get drawn into that. We also wonder what people think about us personally. You know, um, as you're raised, if you have a young family, how are you doing as a parent? You know, how do, I, how do I compare with the other moms? Or if you're uh, the dad, you know, uh, or, you know, am I at all the soccer games? Or all, Goodness gracious, the number of things that young families have to go to these days. You know, we're going through it round two. We're, we're, we're now doing it as the grandparents. But it seems like it's more than doubled in terms of the number of activities that kids can go to these days. And the, the need for you to be the chauffeur or the cheerleader or at least bring the snacks or do whatever. And that's, it's all kind of getting crazy, but, but we do tend to think I'm not a good parent or I'm not a good grandparent or I'm not a good something. And where's that going to put me on the ranking? Jesus flips this upside down. It's not about being the best. It's not about name recognition. It's not about knowing or other people knowing who you are. It's the one who serves. Amen. It's the one that is not even mentioned. It's the one that's behind the scenes, that's doing the dirty work that nobody's ever going to know about. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the greatest. I do want to take a minute just to hold up those that were able to come out. I know not everybody can come out. And this is not intended to be guilt, uh, you know, inflicted here. But camp yesterday, it was great to see so many come out to serve. The opportunities to not come out were abundant. It was rainy. It was cold. There was all kinds of other stuff going on, not to mention road closures and all kinds of things. The, the, the and yet, brothers and sisters, young and old, you know, some that have been around forever, some brand new Christians, a lot of uh, campus and teens were out, and just working. I worked with a, another elder in a far part of the camp, and we started, because we had a big job to do, we started early and we finished late, and we didn't even get to see anybody. We were just like, we're doing this. And a lot of people were kind of like that. If you said, well, who was at camp? We were so scattered that you wouldn't know. There was not an award ceremony at the end who did the most work. There was not a ranking of who got the dirtiest job or who had the hardest job or whatever. It's just everybody said, you know what? Whatever needs to be done, I'm going to do it. I, and let me tell you, there's some nasty jobs at the opening of camp. You know, God, God created the creation to overtake, okay? When, when camp stops, you know, at the end of uh, the, the, the fall or early fall, the, the creation decides to move back in. And that's God's plan. That's the way it's supposed to work. But I mean, we got critters everywhere. We got smells. We got dirt. We got lots of stuff. Um, and, you know, every so often, somebody will move something. There'll be a dead animal. And you'll hear a scream on the far side of the camp. Uh, camp. You know, all that kind of stuff is going on. But everybody does it. We, we glove up. We, we put our mask on. We do what we got to do. And camp is all the better for it. Because of brothers and sisters that are willing to serve. We're all super busy. Once again, this is, no one's trying to judge you based on your schedule or whether you could come or not come, but, but serving is a part 
of making Jesus Lord. There's just no way around it. Maybe you couldn't come out to camp yesterday. Maybe your health isn't good. Maybe, maybe whatever. But, but let me ask you, in terms of just being willing to serve, in some capacity, are you looking for that? Are you looking for ways to, to pour yourself out? Because that's what Jesus said. That's the greatest. The ones that are like little children. The ones that are willing to just get in there and do whatever needs to be done and not make a big deal about it. Like, don't you know who I am and all this entitlement that the world has? It's just a matter of serving, the quiet servant. And I want to say to so many of you, thank you. Genuinely, I know I speak for Kim and the Hope for Kids staff that uh, has a big job as we get ready for another huge summer with sometimes 2,000 people come through camp in the summer. That's a lot of work, a lot of responsibility, but it's because of so many of you that serve in so many different ways, not only with the cleanup, but just during the year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But Jesus said, who's the greatest? The answer is the ones that serve. That wasn't what the disciples were looking for. That's not what they wanted to hear. Next question is, who's the most qualified? Who's the most qualified? That would be the next question from those disciples. Luke 22, verse 31. Jesus speaks to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, this is Peter, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will dis uh, deny me three times that you even know me. Peter was chosen. He was picked by Jesus. Once again, back to Matthew 16. He was the one, not the others, not Thaddeus. You know, not Andrew, his brother. Not James or John. But Peter was picked and given those keys to be the guy that would preach the sermon on the day of Pentecost and to open up the kingdom on earth. He was the guy that was most qualified. He had the personality for it. He was an ambitious leader. He was outspoken. He was well-known. Uh, he, he had, he had uh, uh, kind of a presence about him, right? I mean, you get the impression from Scripture that when Peter walked into the room, everybody knew it. That's who he was. That was the guy. He seemed to be the most qualified. And yet, he caved. He gave in. He succumbed to the pressure around the cross. He got scared. He denied Christ to a soldier with a big shiny sword. No. To a little servant girl standing by the fire. There really was nobody. But he, he, he just went off. He's like, no, no, I don't know the man. And she asked again, I don't know the man. He said. Third time she asked again, and it says, and he called down curses and said, I don't know the man. Now that's a polite, biblical way of saying he swore. <laughs> then he just swore. Now, when a supposed follower of Jesus starts swearing, everybody goes, oh yeah, no, that's not him. <laughs> that's, it, Peter made it really clear. No, 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 that's, that, he must not be with him because that's not the kind of language that a disciple would use of Jesus. Peter made it real clear. I'm not, not my gig. I'm not with this guy. I'm just, a, I'm just watching the scene from afar. And yet he was the most qualified. He was the one that was picked. Some of us are plagued by feeling like we're not qualified. We feel like we don't have the talent. That we don't have the gifts. And we don't have the ability to do what other people, even in the church that we see around us, are able to do. And therefore, we don't really measure up. I'm here to tell you today. You're probably the ones that are most qualified. Amen. You're probably the ones that God is itching to use and say, no, no, no. It, 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 your, your resume isn't going to get in the way. You can easily do this because you're not all caught up in your accolades and accomplishments and things that have gone on around you. God wants to use you. You don't have to be qualified in terms of the world. 
You don't have to be qualified in terms of letters after your name or degrees that are hanging on the wall or something like that in God's kingdom. It's just a matter of having the heart to do his will. That's what I enjoy most about my 48 years as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Is I'm the most average, ordinary, vanilla, boring, not particularly talented in any area person that you'll ever And I don't say that with any sort of false humility. That's just me. I'm that guy. I was this quiet surfer guy that didn't like to speak publicly. It was fine to let somebody else do it. And for whatever God's reasoning, I'm here today doing this because I just decided if the opportunity comes my way, I'm going to assume God knows better than me and I'm going to go for it. Amen. But it's not because of talent or ability or, you know, uh, some sort of awards or anything like that. It's just saying, whatever, God. I know in and of myself, I'm not qualified in the eyes of the world. I'm not great at this. But I said, Jesus is Lord. And I'm going to go for it. Do you worry about your spiritual resume? Do you worry about, am I going to measure up? Or can God really use me? Talk to me. Let me tell you. God wants to use you. Why did Jesus pick the unschooled, the ordinary? Why does God show, choose those people first? Why, do, why does he take fishermen and tax collectors and prostitutes? Because they're not all hung up on themselves. They're all kind of realized they're damaged and they're not particularly good at this, that, or the other. And Jesus comes along. Anybody watch The Chosen? The scenes in The Chosen where Jesus, and, and they really typecast Jesus well. But when he just gives them a look and he says, come follow me, and, and Matthew, the tax collector, hands the keys over, says, I'm out of here, I'm done, I'm going with that guy. That's because this world and doing it the way the world does doesn't really work very well. You're kind of like, I'm on this gerbil wheel, this thing. I just keep running and running and running and running, doing the same sort of thing. I want to do something else, but I'm not sure if I got the chops to do it. And God says, come on, let's do this together. You're qualified. Don't get caught up in who should do this, that, or the other. Just surrender to God. Lastly, what was the third question they asked? Then who's the most ready? Let's go back over to Luke 22. Who's the most ready? Starting at verse 35, it says, Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without bag or purse or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And this is curious, reading this, verse 36. And he said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. What? Wait a minute, Jesus. As it is written, he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what was written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. <laughs> that is enough, he replies. This is a curious passage, isn't it? You know, all you uh, right-to-bear-arms folks, you're like, yeah, there it is. Jesus said, go buy a gun. <laughs> no, don't go there. Okay. What is Jesus really saying? Are you really ready? Who's the most ready? He's saying... I'm leaving, and it's about to get real. The disciples thought that those three years of ministry training was how it's supposed to be forevermore. That's like going to Disney World. Disney World's fun, but it's Disney World. The Magic Kingdom is a Magic Kingdom, not the Kingdom Kingdom, okay? It's, it's not really going to be like this forever. It's fine for fun, or in Jesus' case, for training. And that's what the, the, the limited commission was. Is it's like, okay, we're going to give you a taste of what it's like. You're going to go preach the gospel, and you're going to see some things, and watch some healings, and this and that and the other. But after I'm gone, it's going to get real. And so you've got to get ready to live this, but in the real world, okay? 
And in that context, what he's saying is make, it makes sense because in that real world, things like having a sword was just a regular thing. Self-protection is not wrong, okay? That's not a bad thing. He's just saying, okay, now you as disciples are going to go out there and you're going to have jobs and families, and I still need to be Lord. I'm not going to be here watching every step. You've got to be ready to do it and do it in the real world. It's a lot harder than Disney World. It's a lot harder than the three years of training that I've been putting you through. Who's most ready? Who's ready to go? You know, it, it's fun to go on a missionary journey with the Philadelphia Church to India. It's fun to be a part of a youth corps. It's fun to go out there and be a part of a planting. You know, I, I say of church plantings, and Kim and I have been able to be involved in about six of them in our spiritual ministry sort of career. A church planting is like no other time in your spiritual life. Because you're with a group of people that have literally said, okay, we're moving. We're changing jobs. We're selling our house. We're pulling our kids out of school. We're leaving our old friendships where, where we've been. And we're moving to a new part of the country or maybe to a new part on the other side of the world. And this is going to be us and about 25 or 30 others that are planting a brand new church. Does that group sound committed to you? Yeah. You think that group's going to have any problem sharing their faith and going out and evangelizing and studying the Bible with people? I mean, they sold their house. <laughs> they, they, they changed jobs. They're, they're going for it. That's an awesome time. But you know what? That's not always the real world. Right. It doesn't stay like that forever. Things get more complicated. Those kids grow up. School gets tough. Jobs don't last. Money gets tight. Things don't work out. We didn't get the house we wanted. This, that, the other. Things are getting complicated because that's the real world. That's life. Jesus is saying, are you going to be ready for the real world? You know, when we get baptized and come out of that water, there's no feeling like it. Every sin is forgiven. It's a new start. God doesn't even, biblically we know that God doesn't even remember. He, he keeps no record. You're completely clean, squeaky clean. But it doesn't stay like that. That's why John says we need the blood of Christ to continually cleanse us because we don't stay sinless. We, we've got to live in the real world growing as young disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, there's victory, there's certainly a difference. You got the Holy Spirit, you got the church around you, you got God's word, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're guaranteed, you know, success if we just hang in there. But it doesn't stay like that first couple of days after you're baptized. And that's okay, but that's Jesus' question. Who's the most ready? Who's ready to go? You know, everybody has an idea about how it's going to be. And, and I hesitate to use this quote, but I think it was Mike Tyson that said at one point, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to do this. But, but when life gets really hard, all of a sudden all the big plans and the ideas and this and that go out the window. All the Bible study and all the things. You're like, whoa, I didn't know this was going to happen. That's what Jesus is saying. It's, Are you going to be good during those times? Do you have an on-again, off-again relationship with God? Wow. You know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Do you go off-duty as a disciple? Wow. You're on duty right here, I bet. I think everybody's language is good. <laughs> I think everybody is, is being appropriate as we gather together at Germantown Academy. I... I but do you go off duty? You know, there's certain, certain groups in our society that have the opportunity to go off duty. A police officer, person that serves in a public way, fire department, maybe military, even a doctor, Dr. Jim. If Dr. Jim's off duty and I'm in a car wreck, 
and I'm bleeding out, do I want Jim to go, you know what? Actually, I, I got off the clock half an hour ago, but I can hear the sirens. I think they're coming to get you. We go, wait a minute, you're a doctor, you're trained. I know you're officially off duty, but you're supposed to know what to do. Man, thank goodness for the, the, the men and women in the police force that I think carry a service revolver and in times where they're off duty, if there's an altercation or some sort of situation, they step in. That's life and death threatening situation for them. They could say, I'm off duty, don't make me do it. I, I'm, I'm not on the clock, I'm not getting paid for this. But they don't. They say, okay, I'm trained to do this. This is what I do. Do you go off duty as a disciple? Are you on duty Sundays, Wednesdays, Bible talk, camp? What do you look like during your off-duty times? Would some of us in this room be surprised at your off-duty behavior? Would we be uncomfortable with how you're living to living your life, and yet you may want to play, but, but I deserve, this is me time. What? what? Biblically, tell me about me time again. Tell me about when you get to go off the clock. When you get to not be a disciple. When Jesus doesn't have to be Lord. Now we're not perfect. We all sin. I get it. I'm not, I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm just saying that some of us are going way too far. Are you ready? We've got to be ready. Jesus said this is real world stuff. He says, if you don't have a sword, go buy one. What? What, gee, what? what are you talking about, Jesus? Now, I love the verse after that where the disciple says, hey, Lord, here are two swords. <laughs> and then I've got to believe it. We don't know. i got to believe that next verse where he says, that is enough. He hangs his head and he goes, Tart, Tart, that's enough. In other words, you guys jumped on that way too quick. You got too excited about that. You know, I'll just hear this very quickly. We got some brothers in our fellowship, and mostly when we had our big church-wide services that are in law enforcement and uh, protective services, things like that. And I know who those brothers are because they would often ask me when we were having a big TPAC service or back at U City or whatever, uh, "Are we okay with security?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, we got the ushers. Everybody's ready." No, are you really okay? But you can tell. They were hoping somebody was going to charge the stage or cause a problem or whatever, because that's what they're living for, and that's kind of where you get some of these disciples. Yeah, yeah, hey, Lord, look, we got two swords. And like, settle down, boys. It's not really where we're going with this, but, but we're just saying get ready. Be ready for the real world. Some of us aren't ready. We're ready on certain days, but not others. We're checking out. We're off the clock. And some of us would be embarrassed. If other disciples walked up on us wow. during certain times, wow. let's be ready. Wow. I want to close with a clip about a brother that was baptized literally last Monday in the Rowan Campus Ministry. His name is Ali. And uh, he came to a few days old as a disciple. And we were doing an intern training on Thursday at the church office, and he came doesn't even know what it means to be an intern, but he wanted to check it out. And so here's Ali. He's a weightlifter. He's a wrestler. And uh, Sonny in particular has been working with him. And I wanted to just close with this, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. So Ali. Happy I'm That's a lot of weight. But man, there was a man that came 2,000 years ago that bared so much weight on that cross. He once held the weight of the world on his shoulders. He had all of the sins of the world because you and I have sinned. 
that he paid the price that me and you were supposed to pay. And that is true strength. Oof. And God loves us so much that despite you and I have turned against God, you and I have rebelled against God, that he still sent his son to die for you and me for all of our sins. And to also reconcile with Christ, to have a relationship with him, and to have eternal life. And that is the good news of the gospel. I love you, God bless you, and I hope that this message has touched your heart. Amen. Thank you, brother. Ali, we get to meet him someday. Very inspiring, but he's getting ready. He's a brand new disciple. He doesn't even know what he's in for. But he's like, hey, let's do this. Let's go. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you call us to your kingdom. Father, it's not just the heavenly kingdom that we look forward to, and it's not just a kingdom that we can't see, but in fact, it's a physical kingdom, the church. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We thank you that we can have a relationship with you. We thank you that we can help each other. Father, help us to not get caught up into who's the greatest, but to realize that we need to serve. Help us to not wonder whether we're qualified, but realize that you're eager to take the unschooled and the ordinary. More than anything, help us to be ready. Help us to train. Help us to not go off duty. Help us to not just be Sunday or Wednesday or Bible talk disciples. But to really put you first. We love you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand and have a closing song.